Um, thanks, Nathan. Um, thanks to Pet Darts. Wonderful to be here. Um, I'm going to be presenting a, uh, a shortened version of my introduction, which I had to um, actually like kind of radically revise at the very last minute for a reason I'll explain later. Um, but uh, I hope it has some semblance of continuity and uh, coherence. So. Um, so I'm actually going to begin um, with the reading of a very canonical novel that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Mark Twain's um, Huckleberry Finn. And I'll be concluding by talking about another one um, from the canon, Morrison's Beloved. Um, OK, Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn poses innumerable philosophical questions. But I will begin with a relatively banal one. How can we distinguish between keeping a promise and not breaking one? Keeping a promise, of course, implies not breaking one, but one might argue that the converse is not true. Not breaking a promise might simply indicate a form of negligence, for example, a happy bout of forgetfulness. Keeping a promise tends to imply something stronger, perhaps a resolution, a resolution sustained through an extended act of will. As Nietzsche famously argues in The Genealogy of Morals, the capacity to promise, and thus to keep promises as well, epitomizes an act of will not to let go, an ongoing willing of a, what was once willed, a real memory of the will. Nietzsche's meditation invokes an even stricter criterion. In keeping one's promise, one acts precisely because one has promised, actualizing the will implicit in the initial offering of one's word. But Huck Finn complicates genealogy's account of the will, um, at least as it's given in the section, um, in which the promise, in which the promiser, as Nietzsche says, must have become calculable, regular, necessary, even to his own mind. In Huck Finn, the eponymous protagonist is so incalculable to himself that he at one point decides to play Good Samaritan to a killer in trouble because who knows, he might end up becoming him, becoming him excuse me, he might end up becoming one himself someday. The novel features two pivotal scenes in which Huck, whose agential principles are as fluid as the river that conducts him, decides not to renege on his word without exactly deciding to keep it, at least in the strong sense that Nietzsche imagines. Huck's two decisions not to betray his companion Jim, an escaped slave with whom he's traveling, seem to occupy a nebulous middle ground between keeping and not breaking an earlier promise not to inform on him. Um, Werner Homaker, in an essay on Kant and Nietzsche, argues that promising does not merely instantiate one speech act amongst others, but dictates the very structure of the will. If Huck simply stops short of breaking a promise, in fact, he never uses the word, can he be said to will anything at all? Or alternatively, do his decisions evince what one contemporary philosopher has called, using Huck as an exemplary case, inverse, inverse acrasia. Um, so acrasia is... Uh, Aristotle's term for what's often translated as weakness of will, but really means something like um, acting against one's better judgment. Um, so inverse acrasia here would be a kind of beneficent um, failure to act in accordance with one's judgment. I will suggest that if one, to, um, if one is to adequately respond to these questions, Huck cannot be seen as an individuated moral agent. As, philosoph as philosophical thought experiments devoted to the problem of the will have made him out to be. Rather, he is embedded within a complex, stylistically mediated social situation, whereby competing claims barrage him in the form of internalized and literalized voices. It may seem obvious to point out that Huck cannot be isolated from the specificities of his literary world, but this is precisely what converting his dilemma into a portable thought experiment does. If one is to understand how Huck comes to act without the aid of ideas or ideals, as Lionel Trilling puts it, um, one cannot seal off Huck as a character or agent from the stylistic and generic contortions to which the novel subjects him. <coughs> one unfortunate consequence of beginning with Huck as an independent moral agent, in Trilling's words, as a heroic character, the beginning of moral testing and development, is that this premise marginalizes the force of Jim's intervention in these scenes. First, Huck's ironic crisis of conscience, his sense that he has committed a sin by helping to free a slave, does not spring up ex nihilo, but responds to Jim's ebullient sense of imminent freedom. Huck feels, quote, trembly and feverish only after, quote, Jim said that it made him feel trembly, trembly and feverish to be so close to freedom. It is only at this point that Huck recognizes himself as an agent. <coughs> 
Quote, it hadn't ever come home to me before what this thing was that I was doing. Moreover, because Huck's action is still in progress, this thing I was doing is not yet a thing he has done. It remains open to reversal. But just when he plans to undo the consequences by giving, sorry, but just when he plans to undo the consequences of his act by giving his companion up, Jim's voice, this time directly quoted, once again perturbs his sense of agency. And here, um, I'm not gonna try to render Twain's dialect because this is kind of embarrassing, but I'll try to read it anyway. Um, uh, pretty soon, I'll be a shouting for joy, and I'll say it's all on accounts of Huck. I's a free man, and I couldn't have ever been free if it hadn't been for Huck. Huck done it. Unquote. Jim's appeal to Huck's agent here, agency here is subtle. He figures an incomplete act as a fait accompli. What is more, he retroactively values this accomplished act as the keeping of a promise, which Huck, again, never, in fact, um, articulates explicitly. There he goes, the old, old true Huck, the only white gentleman that ever kept his promise to old Jim. Unquote. We have seen that Huck not only has kept his prom, not only has not kept his promise, but has never even explicitly said the word. And yet Jim's projective construction of what Huck has done decisively shifts the course of Huck's action as the boy mobilizes his lying ways, not against, but on behalf of Jim, telling an elaborate story to a white man so that Jim can evade detection. So here I do not mean to imply that in order to track uh, the shift from Huck's uh, relatively sta uh, static social attitudes to his complications of response, as a uh, critic Richard Poirier says. Um, I, don't, I don't mean to suggest that one must begin with Jim instead of Huck. Um, it would be an error to merely invert the privileging of Huck and characterize Jim as the dominant agent within this scene. Jim's agency consists not in a direct consolidation of will, but in a rhetorical adjustment whereby he shifts his orientation toward Huck and expands the latter's volitional outlook. Jim does not simply address Huck as one character to, an, to another, but rather takes up the perspective of a hypothetical, quote unquote, free man, which suspends the reality of the present in favor of an imagined future, thereby testing out the boundaries between fictionality and the real, between ideal and concrete action. What Trilling calls Huck's moral testing must first of all pass through a stylistic shift which tests out the possibilities and limits inherent in the suspension of the real. In ventriloquizing an as yet fictional free man and thereby figuring Huck's act in the future interior as something Huck will have done, Jim's rhetorical position recalls not so much a character within a dialogue as a romancer's <laughs> capacity to uh, bewitch time itself, as Bakhtin's phrase has it. Um, he's speaking of medieval romances here, but I think, um, I think Jim can be said to be rhetorically bewitching time itself in a way that has a kind of um, affective uh, impact on Huck. Um, so drawing Huck into the suspended reality, Jim perturbs his sense of what is to be done in the narrative's present. The bewitching of, time of, action, of the time of action that infiltrates Huck's agential intuitions is intensified in a second scene in which Huck, this time in Jim's absence, once again provisionally decides to reveal his companion's whereabouts. In this instance, it is not Jim's ventriloquizing speech acts, ventriloquized, sorry, Jim's ventriloquizing speech acts, but rather a vision, kind of reverie, that supplants practical deliberation and displacing the effective protocols of novelistic realism with those of romance, eventually dislodges Huck's decision. Even more overtly than Jim's earlier rhetorical act, this vision, the narrative, this vision voids the narrative present, um, kind of empties it out or suspends it, at once recollecting past acts and propelling Huck toward an imminent choice. The climax of Huck's vision, moreover, actually revises the order in which the remembered events had actually taken place. Um, so this is a quote of, uh, of Huck's um, remembrance of, of the events um, I'll skip the first part of it, but he goes on, and at last I struck the time I saved him by telling him the men we had, uh, by telling him the men we had smallpox aboard, and this is his kind of ruse, um, and he was so grateful, that is Jim, and said I was the best friend old Jim ever had in the world, and the only one he's got now. And then I happened to look around and see that paper. <laughs> 
the paper he's referring to is a letter he has written but not yet sent to Jim's owner. If we assume that this parataxis is supposed to, um, supposed to comprise a linear narrative, it is in fact out of order. In the earlier scene, Jim claims Huck as his only friend before Huck saves him with the lie. In other words, what Bakhtin calls the bewitching of time is reenacted in this reverie, rather than recollecting an actual moment of weakness set off by Jim's voice. Huck assumes the fictional status of a wholehearted initiator of action. But lest we imagine that Huck at this point takes on the status of a sovereign agent with a newly stable moral center, we must recall how Jim's voice continues to resound within his own. Most significantly, Jim's claiming of Huck as the only friend he has now is both conserved ver verbatim and transformed in Huck's vision. By revoicing Jim's now, Huck both absorbs Jim's performative claim and activates it within the now of impending action in the second scene. A strict rendering of memory as a memory might replace the now with the then. But at this point, Huck bewitches time insofar as his, vo his vision resuscitates a past now and reinserts it, reinserts it as a climactic now that registers the urgency of a moral decision, which Huck marks as he decides to destroy his letter, saying to himself, all right then, I'll go to hell. Huck Finn vividly illustrates how volition can shift in accordance with generic and stylistic disruptions of realist conventions, disruptions which push the will toward a new form of social agency. Huck's act of assuming the hellbound, low-down low status of the abolitionist, as he puts it, which is affirmed in the two negative acts I have discussed, marks his will as thoroughly inextricable from the social relations and attitudes in which he's embedded. Richard Poirier argues that Huck's character is at odds with the very notion of society, and hence can, quote, only exist only on the outside of a society that the novel allows us to imagine. So in other words, he's saying that Huck's character is somehow incompatible with uh, sociality itself, um, somehow belongs to the river um, or nature. I would qualify Poirier's claim. While Huck as an identifiable individual is rendered most salient at a remove from society, his will, emerging within the novel's loosening of realist conventions, cannot be separated from the concrete social world proper to the novel as a genre. Um, the concrete social world including um, identifications like lowdown abolitionist. Um, both Huck and Jim only exercise agency insofar as they are situated within a field of generic and stylistic tensions, which complicate our sense overall of how the will operates. This field of tensions is, pre is precisely that of the novel as a form, wherein romance and realism are given free reign to resonate, conflict, and overlap. The history of the novel, that loose baggy genre I will be investigating in this talk, testifies to the ways in which realism must reckon with an ambivalent attachment to romance and vice versa. If Cervantes produced the quintessential novel in Don Quixote, the quixotic Huck Finn proves an exemplary generic descendant. As I am using the term, and as I will deploy it throughout this talk, the novel can be defined um, as a lengthy fictional prose narrative which sustains a productive tension between romance and realism. So I realize this is kind of a tangentious um, definition of the novel, um, and I'd like to address this in the Q&A. I still haven't quite worked out how to deal with this. Um, so romance and realism, as I understand them, do not constitute two genres unto themselves, but rather dual tendencies that animate the novel form in which are at times, but not necessarily in conflict with one another. Um, so just very broadly, uh, romance tends to be um, associated with a kind of uh, testing out of, of the limits of language, um, a willingness to allow imagination to dictate the, sh the shape of a fictional world. Um, romance narratives tend to test out the efficacy of um, what Kenneth Burke calls the quote-unquote magical decree implicit in all languages. The utterance, let there be such and such, articulated as a fiat already moving toward description. So I'm interested in uh, the problem of the will, how it's not only at issue in Twain's work, but in the generic tensions that stimulate the rise and development of the novel form. 
Through my reading of Huck Finn, I have suggested that the problem of the will merges precisely within the interplay between these two tendencies. Although my reading of, the, of Twain has given indications of how I want to use the term will, which seems to confuse almost everyone I come um, in contact with, intellectuals or otherwise, um, one might wonder exactly what I mean by problem of the will in this context, as the concept of the will has been for centuries notoriously difficult to pin down. For now, I will simply say that by problem of the will, I mean the problem of how the subject is to orient him or herself in relation to, the, to a field of prospective action. For the purposes of my inquiry, this formal definition has the advantages of both capaciousness and specificity. First, it narrows down the question of the will by excluding phenomenological criteria. Willing need not entail any particular feeling of willing. Um, so in this sense, my, my study is very different from something, someone like Sarah Ahmed's recent book, uh, Willful Subjects, which is more concerned with the experience of willing um, and kind of brackets um, the, the question of the will's existence. Um, and also Hannah Arendt in her, uh, in her famous intellectual history of the will um, is centered around what she calls the willing ego, which has its characteristics uh, moods such as impatience, disquiet, and worry. Um, so my account is going to eliminate all those, um, or at least eliminate these as criteria, um, even though, of course, these affects might be involved in any act of will. Um, similarly, this, this definition displaces the distinction between conscious attitudes we might associate with the will and unconscious impulses, which might seem willed or unwilled depending on what theory is at issue. Lastly, this definition retains a relation to action, thereby distinguishing it in principle, if not in all empirical cases, from related psychological concepts such as belief and desire, as well as metaphysical concepts that attribute a will to vital forces, matter, or even being as such, as in like, someone like Schelling. Um, I now want to turn to the work of two pioneering theorists of the novel, Lukács and Mikhail Bakhtin, and I hope there won't be too much redundancy um, in light of David's paper. Um, these two theorists offer two distinct vantages on the uh, novelistic will, although this is sometimes lost, I think, in the discourse on, uh, in the literature on, on Lukács and Bakhtin. While recent historicists and, the and theoretical accounts of the novel have by and large marginalized or dismissed the philosophical problem of the will, these early theorists, um, both of whom were not incidentally philosophers, viewed this problem implicitly or explicitly as fundamental to the development of this singular modern literary form. Um, by way of a critical engagement with these early critics, I will uh, help to gradually shape my own account of what it might mean for the novel form to pose and respond to the problem of the will. Okay, um, so I'll begin this next section with a, a quote from Milan Kundera. Um, which is, is a very kind of Lukácsian quote, I think, and as, at least in, the, in terms of the early Lukács. Um, this is from one of his uh, books on, on the novel. He has two, if I'm forgetting which one it is. Um, like the epic in earlier times, the novel, too, is founded on action. But in a novel, action is made problematic, appears as a multifaceted question. If action is merely the effect of obedience, does it count as action? And how, does it, how to distinguish the activity of repetitive gesture from routine? And what does the word freedom mean in a concrete sense in a bureaucratized world, modern world where the possibilities to act are so minute? Kundera here encapsulates the dilemma of the novelistic anti-hero whose imperative to act stands in contradiction to a social world where an action is disciplined, constrained, and controlled, often through systematic and imperceptible mechanisms. The possibility of consequential action devolves into a leap of faith. I believe in nothing if not action, Ralph Ellison's desperate narrator tells us, an invisible man, after encountering, encountering a series of practical deadlocks, which, siphoning out any values that might inform action, have literally driven him into a hole underground. The invisible man's romantic investment in ideas and the possibility of their worldly manifestation register a kind of uh, quixotism, quixotism? I don't know how to actually say that word. Um, in any case. A uh, kind of quixotism without consent, sorry, without content. Quixotism without content. Yet also subtly resists uh, Weberian disenchantment. And so this is the invisible man again. Without the possibility of action, all knowledge comes 
to one labeled file and forget, in quotes, and I can neither file nor forget. This contradiction between the paltry agential affordances of the modern social world and the irre irrepressible excessiveness of the novelistic protagonist um, is at the center of Lukács' theory of the novel. For Lukács, the disjunction between subject and world undergirds the novel as a form registering a split internal to novelistic action in particular. Thus, Lukács anticipates Kundera's observation that the novel is founded on action, but action rendered problematic. For Lukács, novelistic estrangement occurs when, quote, the world of deeds separates itself from men and because of this independence becomes hollow and incapable of, absor of absorbing the true meaning of deeds in itself. Far from deflecting focus away from action then, the novel renders action salient and problematic precisely insofar as action, like the hero himself, fails to find a secure place with the novel's social order. According to Lukács, the situation manifests itself in crime and madness, the hallmarks of the novelistic hero. And this is Lukács. For crime and madness are objectivations of transcendental homelessness, the homelessness of an action in the order of, uh, human order of social relations, the homelessness of the soul in the ideal order of superpersonal, excuse me, the homelessness of the soul in the ideal order of a superpersonal system of values, unquote. Consequently, the paradigmatic hero of the novel is less heroic than demonic. To cite an example Lukács does not himself use, one might imagine Milton's Satan as a transitional figure between epic and novelistic heroism. heroism. Um, as Lukács puts it, the, novel's, the novel hero's psychology is the field of action of the demonic. So this, this phrase, field of action, is very important for me. Um, so while this field of action is at odds with the world's systems of evaluation, it also registers a kind of subject, a subjective energy that continues to insist within this world. Lukács sar sharpens his definition of the demonic by incorporating the terms of Goethe's reflections, whom he cites verbatim. In Goethe's words, quote, everything that restricts us seemed permeable by it, that is the demonic. It seemed to arrange at will the necessary elements of our existence. It contracted time, it expanded space. It seemed at ease only in the impossible. And it thrust the possible from itself with contempt. Lukács' appropriation of Goethe here um, brings together the notion of an impossible action, novelistic action that cannot be subsumed within the world's value system, and the problem of the will with its irrepre irre irrepressible imperative to quote unquote arrange the elements of our existence in the face of this impossibility. Lukács is not unaware of the limits of this categorization. In spite of his provisional characterization of the hero as a sort of demon, he also recognizes within what he calls the romantic novel of disillusionment, an archetype that gravitates um, toward passivity, toward a tendency to avoid outside conflicts and struggle rather than engage in them. And yet if these heroes if these novels' heroes turn away from action, the novels register their concern for worldly action through the very ambivalence and incompleteness that mark the renunciation of the vita activa. The repudiation of deeds itself concerns the life of action, albeit negatively or indirectly. In Lukács, an interiority denied the possibility of fulfilling itself in action turns inward and cannot finally renounce what, is, what it has lost forever. This hero's incorrigible inwardness is not an a priori quality of subjectivity then, but is itself an effect of foreclosed possibilities of action. Surprisingly enough, it is this example of the passive hero that allows one to appreciate the degree to which the novel form in particular is implicated in the philosophical problem of the will. Lukács argues that the passivity of the epic hero, and this is drawing upon Goethe and Schiller, is fundamentally different than the passivity of the novelistic hero. Whereas the former is passive by necessity, the latter need not be. It might seem counterintuitive to say that the epic hero is passive, but what Lukács means is that the epic hero, far from initiating actions of his own accord, integrates himself seamlessly within a, within a totality, um, functioning as an immobile point of uh, the world's rhythmic movement. Paradoxically, one might say that the epic hero must be passive for the same reason that he must be active. Such is the agential structure of the epic cosmos in which a single mode of activity is allotted to him. I mean, this is kind of a caricature, um, notoriously, of the, 
of the epic, but I think it does have a, a kernel of truth that's important. Um, so Lukács argues by way of contrast that, quote, the novel hero's passivity is not a necessity, but represents a distinct type in the structural possibilities of the novel. If the novelistic hero is not necessarily passive, it is because there is nothing inscribed in the order of things that dictates a given orientation toward action. Um, this is why even a novel ostensibly indifferent to human agency may nonetheless be haunted by its loss and evoke the specter of action within its style and form, if not its plot. Mikhail Bakhtin's uh, account of the novel offers, among other things, a corrective to the austere dualism between hero and world that structures Lukács' early work. But we might begin at first with their similarities. Crucial to both Bakhtin and Lukács is, uh, Lukács' view of the novel is the idea of agential testing, testing of the hero. The theme of novelistic testing offers an apt entryway into the problem of the will, since testing out an idea, ideal, or worldview seems to demand the initiative of an agent. Testing is necessarily without a direct, uh, directional activity, um, and because it must proceed without guarantee, requires a kind of will. Invoking the idea of testing, Bakhtin reveals both his proximity to Lukács and his own distinctive approach. So this almost seems like an instance of plagiarism. It's so bizarre, but um, for Lukács, uh, quote, the novel tells of the adventure of interiority. The content of the novel is the story of the soul that goes in search to find itself, that seeks adventures in order to be true, proved and tested by them, and by proving itself to find its own essence. The inner security of the epic world excludes adventure in this essential sense. The heroes of the epic live through a, a whole variety of adventures, but the fact that they will pass the test, both inwardly and outwardly, is never in doubt. Um, on the one hand, Bakhtin's, uh, Bakhtin distinguishes epic from novel with an uncannily similar assessment. For Bakhtin, as for Lukács, testing as a response to a world in which there is no epic dispensation of value which could coordinate a character's worldly orientation. Um, you know, there's nothing necessarily telling Odysseus that he must make it home, say. So, uh, the idea of testing the hero, of testing his discourse, may very well be the most fundamental organizing idea in the novel. This is Bakhtin. One that radically distinguishes it from the epic. From the beginning, the epic hero has stood on the other side of the trial. In the epic world, an atmosphere of doubt surrounding the hero's heroism is unthinkable, unquote. Um, so Bakhtin articulates the significance of testing um, in a somewhat different manner, in spite of the similarities here. Um, first, for Bakhtin, it is not a soul that is tested, but as he puts it in a telling qualification of hero, a discourse. Thus, on Bakhtin's account, there is no significant difference between the quote-unquote adventure of interiority and the adventure of exteriority, which might manifest itself in deeds. Both interiority and exteriority alike would be expressions of a discourse or language image. That is, either interior or exterior representation would actualize one point of view within a heteroglossic assemblage. That is, a plurality of interacting and conflicting values and worldviews that, on Bakhtin's account, um, displace not only the dispensation of the epic world, but also, presumably, Lukács' unitary, superpersonal system of values. Um, against which Lukács defines the novelistic hero. The displacement of the interior-exterior binary seems to pro provide a more flexible, flexible theoretical model insofar as it offers a common denominator for the wide variety of subjective orientations exhibited in, in, in this most unwieldy of genres. Um, one senses the potential of Bakhtin's approach to testing in action, most vividly in his individual readings of texts, most notably those from his early work on Dostoevsky, that quintessential Bakhtinian novelist, whose work is devoted to, quote, this is Bakhtin, putting a person in extraordinary positions that expose and provoke him for the purpose of testing the idea and the man of the idea. Bakhtin argues that the testing of discourse works not through direct enactment, but through an interpersonal negotiation, which both informs and decenters the testing will. So Bakhtin has many stunning, um, stunning readings within his corpus that, that follow along these lines. Um, but I think when one views the question of the will in terms of Bakhtin's more general theoretical commitments, the primacy accorded to discourse testing presents a problem insofar as it renders vague the status of novelistic action as such. Bakhtin's work on the novel, 
um, at times dismisses the significance of action altogether. In Discourse in the Novel, is one of perhaps his most famous essay, he says, no less than a person in a drama or an epic, a person in a novel may act. A person in a novel may act. But such action is always highlighted by ideology, is always harnessed to the character's discourse, even if that discourse is as yet only a potential discourse. And it is associated with an ideological mo motif and <coughs> occupies a, a definite ideological position. Thus, novelistic action for Bakhtin seems nothing more than a symptom of this definite ideological position, which for Bakhtin means not something like false consciousness, but uh, more like a concrete worldview. Um, this devaluation of action raises another question. To what degree is action necessary to test discourse? A comparison with the position Lukács comes to develop roughly around the same time, um, as B Bakhtin publishes this essay, Discourse in the Novel, is instructive. For the more polemical Lukács of narrate or describe, the novel must retain a connection with uh, testing via concrete action. Men's words, subjective reactions, and thoughts are shown to be true or false, genuine or deceptive, significant or fatuous in practice, as they succeed or fail in deeds and action. And again, Lukács. Without the interaction of struggle among people, without testing in action, everything in composition becomes arbitrary and incidental. Um, this is not the place to engage with Lukács' controversial aesthetic and ideological evaluations. I simply want to demonstrate, by way of contrast, the ambiguity in Bakhtin's own view of novelistic action. On the one hand, Bakhtin holds that, quote, the action and individual act of a character are essential in order to expose, as well as test, his ideological position, his discourse. On the other hand, um, Bakhtin repeatedly reduces novelistic action to a mere um, ornament of this a kind of a, just a, a side piece of this ideological position, often lumping it, lumping it in with the discourse on which it is said to depend. Quote, the activity of a character in a novel is always ideologically demarcated. He lives and acts in an ideological world of his own um, and not the unitary world of the epic. He has his own perception of the world that is incarnated in his action and in his discourse. So I, I sense that Bakhtin at once subordinates action to discourse and sometimes uses them in a kind of sloppy, interchangeable way. Um, um, Bakhtin is ultimately more invested in human dynamism than in action per se. In accordance with his more general view of uh, human subjectivity, Bakhtin defines the novelistic protagonist in terms of its incompleteness. There always remains in him an unrealized potential there always remains in him unrealized potential and unrealized demands." Unquote. But Bakhtin's insistence on the protagonist's, quote, unrealized potential also functions to underwrite his demotion of plot and action, devices of which the novel depend on to formalize the effects of decisive agency. According to Bakhtin, the novel is fundamentally concerned with, quote, the theme of the hero's inadequacy to his fate or his situation. While there is certainly something to this claim, one should nonetheless note that a character's fate or situation tell us a great deal about a character's agential specificity. A character's fate or situation necessarily reveals something about his or her concrete potentiality, to use Lukács' Hegelian language, about the specific ways in which a character commits or fails to commit to specific actions. For Bakhtin, however, the actualization of character is less important than the diffuse specters of the possible that the no novels conjure up. Quote, reality as we have it in the novel is one of many possibilities. It is inevitable, it is not inevitable, excuse me, it is not inevitable, not arbitrary. It bears within itself other possibilities. Because he minimizes the distinction between concrete potentiality and abstract potentiality, between the actualized and the abstractly possible, any effort to reconstruct a strictly Bakhtinian account of the will confronts a theoretical deadlock. At this point, I want to step back and reposition the theory of the, these theories in the novel by developing a schematic history of the will, which will focus on the idea of an imperative or command. Um, I am not merely interested in the command's capacity to produce obedience or, um, or to fail to produce obedience, but the way in which it produces uh, dynamic agential orientations that emerge within its magnetic field. 
This section, on the one hand, will help us situate Lukács and especially Bakhtin philosophically, and on the other hand, provide the groundwork for one of my key arguments, um, namely that the novel opens up and renders a problematic relation um, to a field of efficacious action, which functions as a, as a condition of its intelligibility. In contrast to various philosophical threads that, ab that would absorb willed action into language without remainder, reduce it to naturalistic process, or dismiss it as an utterly mysterious phenomenon, novelistic form will be seen to both complicate the relation between willed action and language and render their differentiation salient. I'm only halfway through this. How am I doing? Through the time. Halfway through? Good. Um, as philosophers steeped in the legacies of post-Kantian German idealism, Lukács and Bakhtin are well aware of the dilemmas inherent in thinking the reality of the will within a naturalized cosmos and in a disenchanted modern world. In this section, I want to show how the relationship between the will and the novel, which all three, all, all, excuse me, all two, sorry, I had three, I was talking about Ortega earlier, and, um, which both theorists into it. Um, stems from a prior imbrication of the concept of the will with language and its performative power. We have seen that Twain's Huck Finn imaginatively narrates the tensions and resonances which obtain between spoken word and will deed. This novelistic testing, as I, should, as I shall suggest, is rooted in the tension between language and action that the philosophical conceptualization of the will brings into view. Um, while both speech act theory and philosophies of um, symbolic action have explored the conditions under which wills can con excuse me, under which wills constitute deeds, the philosophical history of the will um, reveals both the mutual dependence and irreducible difference between words and actions. In other words, if speech acts and symbolic actions are structured as scaled down versions of divine volition, wherein there is no possible gap, gap between the lingu no possible gap between the linguistic fiat and consummated action, the problem of the will arises when the charged gap between word and deed is recognized as simultaneously galvanizing and insuperable. This is not, of course, to say that a willed action in philosophical accounts or novelistic narratives cannot take shape as a linguistic act. Rather, I want to focus on the ways in which uh, potential or actual action both depends upon language and remains in excess of language as such. More specifically, the philosophical trajectory I'll trace uh, focuses on the problem of the will, um, how the will emerges as a function of the indeterminate ramifications of linguistic stipulation. Um, the let there be that I cited earlier with, uh, in Kenneth Burke. One reason this is necessary is because the specificity of the concept of will, as opposed to say that of intention or purpose, and here is in the form of command, propounding a definition much more tra traditional than he perhaps knew, Nietzsche differentiates the concept of the will on this basis. Unlike mere striving or wishing, willing essentially involves the form of command and its attendant affects. Moreover, by correlating will with the function of command, one can distinguish the problem of the will um, from the problem of intention, which I guess I already said. Um, and the problem, because the problem of intention is not itself related to a sign or a symbol. Um, so I think animals can be said, animals without language can be said to act intentionally. Um, in this way, the will can be shown to have an essential relation to the symbolic potentiality of language. Um, so I initially had a section on uh, Augustine here, which is important, but I had to cut it. Um, so I'll begin with the practical philosophy of, of Immanuel Kant which views the human will as bound up with the form of a universalizable maxim, or what he calls a categorical imperative. Recognizing that the existence of will can neither be deduced from an authoritative source nor induced from empirical evidence, Kant inquires into the conditions under which we can imagine ourselves as free beings at all. Concluding that rational beings can only be considered free and autonomous insofar as they act under the form of a law by which they can constrain themselves, rather than any act from any content that would determine them from without. Kant raises the question, what does it mean that the self-issued imperative commands us at every point? Kant argues, in effect, 
that because we are finite beings and, there, and thereby subject to unconditional commands, unlike the uh, holy will, um, the divine will, which uh, doesn't need commands because it's always already acting um, in accordance with the law. Um, and finite beings never actually fulfill the law. But far from being a cause for despair, this is the impossibility that is the very condition of the finite will. To take a concrete example of his mode of thinking here, I will consider Kant's reading of the biblical injunction to love one's neighbor as oneself, which he revisits a few times and reworks um, over the course of his practical philosophy. Um, Kant's understanding of this injunction is quite complex. He neither dismisses the commandment on the grounds of its impossibility, nor thoroughly embraces its possible ful fulfillment. For a figure like Augustine, our deficiency as human beings implies that we need grace in order to fulfill divine imperatives. For Kant, whose practical philosophy obviates the need for a theological edifice, the imperative as such is accorded a greater role insofar as its formal force alone dictates our freedom from base inclinations. Uh, first, confronted with the notorious impossibility of loving on command, Kant must offer an interpretation that renders the law more subjectively approachable. Um, so in his interpretation, quote, to love one's neighbor means to practice all duties toward him gladly, with Kant's emphasis on gladly. While such a practice, as rearticulated re by Kant, might seem more vi viable than simply loving, Kant nonetheless concludes, uh, the command that makes this a rule cannot command us to simply have this division, this disposition, that is a glad disposition, in dutiful actions, but only to strive for it. So even as he uh, rearticulates neighbor love in terms of uh, uh, performing duties gladly, he recognizes that there's a problem of regress, that one can't will gladness. Um, so here we have the, the injunction to strive, uh, to perform actions gladly. Um, but even thus translated, the commandment is still in one sense self-contradictory. On the one hand, if we already possessed the requisite gladness, there would be no need for command. On the other, quote, if we did it without liking to do it, but only from respect for the law, this practice would contradict gladness. Thus, the necessity of striving to be adequate to the law stems from, on the one hand, our inability to act morally without the law, and on the other, the respect that enjoins us to continuously respond to the law's force. The very notion of striving um, should not mislead here, because unlike other evocations of striving in the history of philosophy, the striving is not necessitated by a kind of urge within the individual being itself, by its, uh, by its specific nature. Um, but only by uh, the formal properties of the command, commandment as such. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll move on to Hegel here, um, who's responding to uh, to Kant almost everywhere in his practical thought. Um, so positioned within a post-Kantian framework, Hegel's account of the will as developed in the section on morality and the phenomenology of spirit renders the presupposition of language explicit and further specifies its function. In particular, in the transition from uh, Kant's practical philosophy to Hegel's, we will see that the subject incurs the burden not only of giving himself the law, but of specifying in speech his precise relation to the law, and thereby giving his will an, over, an overtly authorial dimension. So this is, uh, this is part of the, the narrative I'm developing here, which might not be too clear. It might seem like a, a um, digression, but um, I want to show the various ways in which the law doesn't simply uh, command obedience, but produces these various uh, different ways in which one feels compelled to respond to it. Um, Okay, to, to show how this is the case, I will begin with Hegel's concept of conscience, which perhaps counterintuitively manifests itself solely as vocally authorized action. This rethinking of conscience is significant for the philosophical tra trajectory I've been tracking because it is, it is in this context, is the, is it, it is, excuse me, it is in the context of this discussion that Hegel defines, quote, acting as actualization 
and as, quote, the pure form of willing. Conscience is not merely a feeling or a sensation, often supposed to sting, but rather what Hegel will eventually call a, quote, divine creative power. It, quote, knows and does what is concretely right. Conscience is moral acting as acting, which transitions beyond the stage of an abstract morality devoid of deeds. So one can think of a Kant's um, separation between intention and actualization of the deed. I think that's what he means by devoid of deeds. Hegel further sharpens his definition of conscience by arguing that its actualization consists not simply in an action's content, that is its element of singular individuality, but in the action's form, which he posits as one's own conviction. Um, so I think that's a really interesting definition of action's form, one's own conviction. Hegel regards this form of actions, um, re regards this as the form of action's essence. Conviction relates to conscience, uh, excuse me, conviction relates conscience to moral duty insofar as conscience has a conviction about moral duty, thereby bringing action to the status of being recognized. Um, an air sign in, um, in the German. Uh, that is to say, to the status of actuality, which is uh, one and the same as being recognized. Um, I think that we're not yet at the stage of uh, which Hegelian liberals like to talk about of mutual recognition of, of um, someone's humanity or something like that, but just a, a bare kind of recognition of an action as, as one's action, kind of accrediting of the action. Uh, in Hegel's view, conviction itself only achieves actuality insofar as it is articulated in language, lest action appear as merely exterminate determinal act, exter, excuse me, as merely, quote, existent determinate action, which cannot on its own meet the demands of universal self-consciousness. Consciousness must, quote, give voice to conviction, thereby securing the validity of action, that's Hegel's quote, in its universal dimension. The knowing and willing self can only become itself by testifying in speech to its conviction that it accomplishes its duty. So that was probably really dense, but I'm um, going to revisit in the Q&A, um, perhaps. In contrast to Kant, then, Hegel emphasizes the necessity of the willing subject becoming an articulating subject, one who literally formulate, formulates his conviction in language. The subject can only will an action insofar as he can speak to his concrete sense of right and thereby rendering, render his action explicitly universal. But universality at this dialectical stage does not imply consensus, as I suggested earlier. The willed action must simply be registered as such, and this registration does not preclude social contentiousness. Um, so here is, I think, a good transition point to, uh, to Bakhtin. Um, So in Bakhtin's later work, he takes this kind of authorial dimension of the will to, a, to an extreme, um, evoking this notion he calls the speech will. The speech will articulates a specific point of view by measuring out an utterance. For Bakhtin, the speech will both initiates and measures the finalization of the utterance. Um, according to Bakhtin, in contrast to the earlier philosophers I've discussed, this volitional expression is not necessarily tethered to moral commands or moral convictions. Rather, it is related to genres and styles. The speaker's speech will, Bakhtin writes, is manifested primarily in the choice of a particular speech genre. And the choice of genre carries with it the emergence of style. Any style is inseparably, this is Bakhtin, any style is inseparably related to the utterance and to typical forms of utterances, that is, speech genres. Moreover, style is not simply subordinated to genre here, um, but under certain conditions violates or renews a given genre. So to briefly recapitulate, um, I want to start with, the, start with Hegel here. For Hegel, the abstract formalism of the Kantian law presents its own threat to the will. Hegel responds by compounding the volitional burdens of language taken on by the subject of uh, articulation 
On the one hand, conscience, with both, which both Kant and Hegel view as the medium through which one apprehends pure duty. On the one hand, it's immune from any given content, from any specific action. On the other hand, conscious is immune from the determinate only because, in Hegel's phrase, it makes its, it makes its determination from itself alone. And this self-determination presents a problem insofar as determinateness as such plunges the self into the realm of sensibility or nature, wherein the, will, wherein the free will appears as, quote, arbitrary free choice, and the rational agent appears in his, quote, unconscious natural being. As we have seen, the law alone, which guarantees only a mute moral consciousness at odds with itself, that's Hegel's, quote, um, mute, the law alone cannot sublate the, this opposition internal to the movement of conscience. Rather, the declaring of one's conviction transmutes the mere act into the, quote, executive deed. And finally, Bakhtin's account of volition as a form of speech imposes all the additional demands on authorship and stylization. Just as the early Bakhtin imagines the authorial agent as free from not only causal or cognitive necessity, so he's referring to Kant there, um, but also from aesthetic necessity uh, of the kind exemplified in rhythm. So he imagines this kind of arrhythmic moment as, a, as the moment of freedom. Um, so the late Bakhtin similarly uh, formulates authorial agency in heroic terms as a quest for, quote, genre and style. During the course of this, uh, this history, wherein language is increasingly counted on to guarantee the validity of action, something happens to the category of action itself. Action, that sine qua non of the will, and moreover, an a priori necessity for the very legibility of narrative. I'm taking this from an argument um, Paul Ricoeur makes <clears throat> in, his, uh, in his book, Time and Narrative. Um, action comes to seem rather weightless. Uh, Whereas a figure like Augustine links the divine imperatives <clears throat> to the possibility of sinful or virtuous deeds, and Kant formulates the categorical imperative as an injunction to act in a, in a universalizable manner, Hegel develops the progress of moral consciousness in a way that ends up abolishing action altogether. In fact, it is his very elevation of the spoken word into a force of actualization that sanctions the erasure of this action. At the end of the section on morality, Hegel suggests that the confessing consciousness facilitates, through speech, action's self-abolition. By which I mean confessing is itself a speech act that abolishes, uh, abolishes action. Okay, so, yeah, Hegel suggests that the confessing consciousness facilitates through speech action and self-abolition. Um, so in a kind of stunning quote, he says, the wounds of spirit heal and leave no scars behind. It is not the deed that is imperishable, but rather the deed is repossessed by spirit into itself. Thus, Hegel's valorization of uh, spoken language as a moment in the progression of Geist ends up spiriting away the material traces of action. We have already seen that Bakhtin subordinates the reality of language to, excuse me, Bakhtin subordinates the reality of action to that of language, but this is not all. While he does not sub subscribe to Hegel's teleological and idealist commitment to the oneness of world historical spirit, Bakhtin's promotion of dialogism to the status of the determining principle of the novel amounts to a comparable idealist uh, dissolution of volition. True, Bakhtin writes, even in the novel, heteroglossia is by and large always personified, incarnated in individual human figures with disagreements and oppositions individualized. But such oppositions of individual will and minds are submerged in, ho in social heteroglossia. They are reconceptualized through it. To reconceptualize the will is one thing, to submerge it another. Bakhtin doubles down on this reduction writing, oppositions between individuals are only surface, surface upheavals of the untamed elements of social heteroglossia. 
Um, at this point, Bakhtin's account of willing recalls more uh, Schopenhauer than, uh, than Hegel or Nietzsche. Uh, the, quote, untamed elements that are individuated by way of, say, character in a novel are rendered here abstract and well-nigh unthinkable. The volitional dimension of style is reduced to a kind of blind striving that is, cons that is constitutive of linguistic sociality as such. Um, in spite of this critique, I want to recuperate and critically develop Bakhtin's indispensable insights into the relation between um, novelistic stylization and volitional orientation. In contrast to Bakhtin, I will argue that what Lukács calls the novelistic field of action must be retained as central to any count of the novel's, um, novel form's inheritance and redeployment of the problem of the will. Just as confession can never fully heal the wounds of action, um, with apologies to Hegel, Heteroglossia can never neutralize the volitional ramifications of such novelistic devices as character and plot. Within this next brief section, I will argue that the novel as a form rethinks the relation between stylization and the will, precisely through its structural commitment to character and action. What will emerge is an account of character irreducible to a structurist, a structuralist, that is a functional or humanist, that is my medic model of character, namely an account of character, an account in which character appears, um, excuse me, let me start again. Um, what will emerge in an account of uh, character, in my account of character, is irreducible to a structuralist, functional or humanist mimetic model, namely an account in which character appears as a potential agent irreducible to a human-like entity or structural function. Um, so in defining novelistic character, kind of speculatively here, and again, rather tangentiously for the sake of my project, um, I'll be giving primacy to style over substance. That is substance in both its philosophical and colloquial senses as both an ontological category and designation, designation of concreteness as opposed to abstractness. In this sense, I am resisting the standard premises that have guided inquiries into novelistic character. That is where critics and theorists have tended to organize their accounts around one of two questions, who is character or what is a character. I will begin with a different problem which foregrounds, which foregrounds the concept of stylization. How is a character? In what manner does a character exist in a fictional world? My assumption is that character is invariably stylized insofar as it exposes itself to the stylizations that permeate the novel form itself. Moreover, insofar as novelistic stylization exceeds the boundaries of an indi individual subject, it cannot be thought on the model of individual expressivity. As we have seen in the case of Huck Finn, um, novelistic character cannot be quarantined uh, from the more abstract and volatile operations of romance. Huck's very character expands and shifts with his exposure to these dimensions. I want to suggest not only that character is a, st is a site for novelistic stylization, but also characters themselves act stylistically insofar as they are said to will. Um, and here, Bakhtin's description of the character zone a concept he deems a, quote, most interesting object of study for stylistic and linguistic analysis, unquote, but does not develop in detail, is helpful here. Bakhtin defines the character zone as, quote, the field of action for a character's voice, encroaching in one way or another upon the authorial voice. Um, so again, I think we can see the equivocation in uh, Bakhtin's account of agency, where um, he uses a term like action, but it's the... Uh, only the action of a voice, so the kind of dimension of, of subject of agency is, is, is always a little bit shaky. Um, uh, the character zone is thus not only subject to certain linguistic forms, but is simultaneously a mode of subjecting to a, the world to a response that channels these linguistic forms. The zone constitutes a certain arrangement of stylized elements that does not merely add up to a context for a functional paper person, but affects the transmission of stylizations and thereby renders them transformative. Again, however, the crux of the issue is what sort of transformation is at stake 
Bakhtin notes that the character zone, what he also calls a sphere of influence, extends and often quite far beyond the boundaries of the direct discourse allotted to him, that is the character. But in my view, the, the field of action, and here I follow Lukács, who invokes the same phrase in reference to agents, not voices, implies a character's potential action as such, not simply its speech. Moreover, I want to suggest that part of what it means to orient oneself within a field of action is to bear the potential to open this field, expand it, to shape its contours. On account of the stylistic resources through which it is simultaneously determined and determining, the character exists as a potentially extended will in the sense that some um, contemporary philosophers speak of an extended mind that expands the scope of cognition beyond the material boundaries of the brain and even the body. Um, novelistic character can thus be defined as um, the novel site of mediation between stylization and a field of potential action. Character, in other words, marks a transitional site, also possibly a site of suspension, blockage, or deflection, between literary uh, stylizations and modes of willed action registered through structuring devices. Um, and here, I think, uh, I wanna take a brief detour um, through what Roland Barthes calls the proheretic code. And this is kind of what I'm relying on to uh, as a way of uh, guaranteeing the structural uh, integrity of, of the space of action. Um, so for Barth, the, the proheretic code um, is what endows what Lukács and Bakhtin called the field of action with a structural and not merely thematic necessity. The code of potential actions becomes a condition of narrative intelligibility. So he um, develops this in his reading of, of Balzac Sarrazin. Barth crucially takes proheretic from Aristotle's term proheresis, translated, um, translated from the Greek and then from the French to the English, as the ability rationally to determine the result of an action. <coughs> the proheretic code not only accounts for the legibility of indiv individual actions, but also their sequential relations. Um, such sequences of narrative action imply a logic in human behavior. Um, so this is interesting to me because I, you know, people often think that uh, Kant's definition of freedom as beginning a, a sequence, a new sequence, is somewhat unintelligible. Like Adorno was really frustrated, and you know, he's like, if I throw down a book and pick it up again, throw it down, turn a page, like at what point am I uh, continuing a series or beginning a new one? Um, which I grant is a problem in, in, uh, in life, but I think there's a way in which narrative makes sequences intelligible. Um, if that makes sense. And in particular, the novel can make uh, a form of willing in terms of its sequencing um, intelligible. While Barthes is quick to insist that in narrative, the discourse rather than the characters determine the action, he hedges by positing a mutually constitutive relation between discourse and character. Uh, quote, Sarazine is impassioned, so this is the, the character that he's studying, Sarazin is impassioned because the discourse must not end. The discourse can continue because Sarazin, impassioned, talks without listening. Both, both circuits are necessarily undecidable. So, um, my notion of character as a side of mediation, I think, offers a new perspective on this problem. The category of stylization, on my account, cuts across discourse and character in such a way that one could speak of stylized character determining the action without resorting to characters endowed with an extra textual free will or submitting to the tautological claim that discourse determines the action. So I think um, Barth tends to make arguments like discourse has a, a kind of preservation instinct or something, which seemed to me kind of untenable, um, even as metaphors, because uh, it's entirely redundant. Um, I think it doesn't explain, for one, how, how a, a discourse would begin or end. Um, 
Okay, at this point I want to um, try to cash out some of the claims and speculations I've made um, through a reading of, of Toni Morrison's Beloved, which um, won't take too long. Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay, yeah. Um, so in this reading I'm, I'm going to focus on a um, single act, uh, which is Setha's uh, quote-unquote rough choice, the decision to murder her revenant daughter. Are you guys familiar with this plot, most of you? Okay. Um, so, Setha um, decides to murder her revenant daughter rather than surrender her to a life of bondage and degradation. Um, this is a this is in the context of a chapter I have on the on the Gothic novel. Um, so, and I think this is this kind of complicates the uh, the account I gave in Twain. Um, it's kind of a a more uh, elaborate uh, variation of that reading. Um, critics have most often read Setha's choice as either an autonomous moral decision or a forced choice imposed on her by unbearably unjust historical conditions or something in between. The Gothic dimension of the novel, however, allows us to reconsider the manner in which radical action might be informed by presences which will not leave history behind. Um, so in the remainder of this talk, um, I want to unfold the extraordinary complexity that Morrison suggests and hears within a single character's volition. In contrast to Huck Finn, we will see that the evocation of various virtual collectivities expands the will to sublime proportions that push at the very limits of novel form. Setha's will does not simply express her character as an individual, but reactivates the will of nameless slaves um, uh, who are trying to kill themselves during the Middle Passage. And this is actually dramatized in the, in the book itself. So my claim is, is part of what's forgotten is that Setha doesn't only murder her daughter, but, uh, but goes to the shed to commit a murder-suicide. Um, um, so the will here does not take form as an effort to act for personal reasons. Rather, will is a form of volition that stems from the slave ship's unbearable confine and confinement of the body as such. An incorporeal will develops out of a sense of the limitations of the generic body, the any body. As beloved, the character puts it, uh, this is in a kind of uh, um, interior monologue later in the novel, we are all trying to leave our bodies behind it is hard to make yourself die forever. Um, while Beloved eventually identifies Setha by name as one of the figures on the ship, um, her own representation of the suicidal will begins with the anonymous occupants of the ship. Someone is trembling. I can feel it over here. He is fighting hard to leave his body, which is a small bird trembling. Before Setha's name is mentioned, Beloved describes the attempted suicide of an anonymous woman. She goes in, they do not push her, she goes in. By the time Beloved invokes Setha's proper name, Setha went into the sea, she has already located Setha at the scene of the garden, which is kind of a traumatic uh, scene she keeps referring to. Setha is the one that picked the flowers. This sequence invites us to consider Setha's leap into the sea not as an act rooted in, say, the peculiar excess of pride or love that so irks her neighbors, but as a kind of narrative grafting or saturation. Um, in Beloved's account, the character that is, uh, the attempted murder-suicide in the garden prompts the palimpsestic displacement of the anonymous woman with Setha onto Setha. Thus, when one attends to the Gothic, um, this kind of vertiginous dislocation of the will, Setha's leap into the sea appears as a mediation, a narrative hinge between two acts. The attempted suicide of the anonymous woman, one among a collective, and Setha's own murder and concomitant abandonment of beloved. What is more, the will has a mythical dimension that further implicates it within the space of collective agency. The description of Setha's rough choice in which the act of, um, act of flight actually uh, supplants psychological interiority. Um, and the quote is, uh, and this is I think what you're talking about. And if she thought anything, it was no, no, 
No, no. No, 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 no. Simple. She just flew. Um, so on the one hand, the conditional here, if she thought anything, registers a kind of traumatic distortion of psychological representation, confusion about whether this form of negativity even counts as a thought. And yet, as though propelled by the intensity of its traumatic ne negativity, the no advances and then accelerates, as though ramping up toward flight. And indeed, she just flew. A paralysis within thought stylizes itself in an initiation of action. The evocation of Setha's flight immediately follows a snag in the chapter's rather conventional psychological realism. Setha acknowledges that neither personal narrative nor psychological motivation can explain what prompted her to act. Because the truth was simple, not a, drawn, not a long drawn out record. But even a simple truth can be haunted. The Gothic saturation here is what informs the will, not the extensive intricacies of psychological motivation. Setha's friend, Stamp Pay's rumination on Setha's flight describes not a motive, but a stylization of action, a manner of flying. He thinks of, quote, how she flew, snatching up her children like a hawk on the wing, how her face beaked, how her hands worked like claws, how she collected them every which way. In this instance, to leave the body behind is not to die or to become disembodied, but to metamorphosize in a pursuit of radical action. Setha's bird becoming thus stylizes the flying African myth in which the proud enslaved Africans would jump off a ship seeking to both end their mortal life and fly back to Africa to join their ancestors. Um, so it has this kind of uh, intertextual dimension as well as an uh, intratextual dimension. Thus, read in terms of stylized extension of the myth, the suicidal will here does not seek to terminate life, or only seek to, to terminate life, but also to establish a space on the other side, as Seth puts it, where kinship relations are poss possible. So here, the other side in the myth would be Africa. Um, the other side uh, in Beloved is a little less clear, but... Um, as Setha herself confirms, quote, my plan was to take us all to the other side where my own man is. They stopped me from getting there. Thus, Setha's killing of her baby morphs into the positive gesture of summoning her back into being. Setha's belief that, in her daughter Denver's words, nothing ever dies, inflects the, her manner of mourning, her outrageous claim that killing her baby was the right, the, the outrageous claim is, a, uh, is a, a way of describing her kind of conviction that what she did is right in the novel. Um, that killing her baby was the right thing to do because it ensured safety marks willing as a kind of effort toward hospitality. Setha's actions after the murder are devoted toward creating and, sus and sustaining for her children what she perceives to be a safe haven. Just as Gothic intensification synthesizes the attempted suicide of the woman on the slave ship and Setha's suicidal flight to the shed, it also yokes together two ostensibly opposed gestures. Setha's erection of a marked grave for beloved and her act of summoning the abandoned child with a whisper. Setha's whisper in beloved's narrative seems to revive, the, seems to revive beloved's moribund being by offering her, quote, a place to be. And this is, again, beloved um, in a kind of fragmented uh, first personal narration. I need to find a place to be. The air is heavy. I am not dead. I am not. There is a house. There is where she whispered to me. I am where she told me. I am not dead. Beloved's own transition from a zone of non-being, I am not, back into life, I am not dead, is facilitated by a welcoming whisper, a whisper that somehow coincides with the place itself. There is what, there is what she whispered to me. The saturation of the whisper by the locale undersc underscores the degree to which the agency of voice is bound up with spatial relations that counter the act of abandonment even if the traumatic impact of the abandonment uh, remains tragically resistant to reconciliation. 
I have already shown that Setha's act of flight is not an act of individual volition, but instead a reconstitution, the more generic capacity she assumes without conscious thought. Similar, similarly, Setha's whisper cannot be construed as an individual speak, uh, speech act. What makes the whisper possible is not an individuated mind whose directive voice is a sign of sovereign agency. Rather, the whisper carries a trace of an act of inscription made possible by Setha's generative rehabilitation of the collective suicidal will. In one sense, Setha accomplishes her goal, that is to bring Beloved and herself to the other side, that is to the house here. When Beloved appears in the flesh, Setha sees her ambiguously suicidal aim as fulfilled in terms that recall her experience on the intolerable slave ship and her subsequent leap into the sea, Setha thinks, quote, I couldn't lay down nowhere in peace back then. Now I can, I can sleep like the drowned. Have mercy. If Setha's act does not achieve a desired resolution, it is because she has inadequately accounted for another will, a will that violates the terms of the invitation that it nevertheless accepts. Setha's will, as I have suggested, surpasses the spatio-temporal limits of the finite human person. Beloved, the character, however, embodies a will that stylistically intensifies the spiritual collective through which it is constituted. Setha rightly suggests that Beloved is returned to me of her own free will, she says, but perhaps erroneously assumes that her free will is bound by a moral, is bound in both a moral and ontological sense to a strict filial sense of duty. As Beloved's sojourn, or more precisely series of returns, suggests this free will is not at all calculable in terms of kinship relations. In the case of Beloved, the problem of the possessed will is multiplied to sublime proportions. The vengeance she wreaks responds not only to the infant infanticide, but to the suffering of, quote, six million and more, um, for which she herself is a figure and to whom Morrison um, dedicates the novel. If Beloved acts primarily through a vengeful resistance to the historical violence of abandonment, her style of act and acting transcends the baseness of a vengeful will, impotently trying to reconfigure the past. Beloved style of acting, of dancing, of silently resisting, in short, of shining, in Morrison's word, gives the collective reanimated, reanimated will a kind of sublimity that refuses to submit to historical reconciliation. Um, and yeah, I'll end there. Um,